Hello, and welcome to Tile Trends, the podcast where we dive deep into the world of tile design and home renovation. I'm your host, Lindsay Flukiger, and today we have a very special guest joining us. She's not only a financial compliance attorney, but also the creative genius behind R1890 Contique, where she shares the journey of restoring her stunning federal mansion in Albany, New York. Please give a warm welcome to Mehek Jamil. Mehek, it's fantastic to have you on the show. Thanks so much for having me, Lindsay. I'm so excited and creative genius. I feel like you're talking about someone else, but very kind of you. <laughs> We're so excited to have you with us today. Thank you for taking the time to sit down and chat. We would love to hear more about your background. Tell us everything about who you are and your journey to get to where you are today. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Big question. So uh, like you said, I'm a financial compliance attorney. I'm Pakistani Muslim American. Um, I grew up right outside of Princeton, New Jersey, met my husband about seven years ago and from our first date to the day we got married was about five and a quarter months, uh, which is crazy. Um, so mar- met him, married him, moved out to Albany. He's born and raised Albany. He's in real estate. So obviously has a lot of interest in real estate properties. Um, how we ended up in this house, we started with just you know a standard two-bedroom, two-bath townhome. And when we we had our first kid and she was about a year and a half old and we started kind of looking for other places. Albany is actually one of the oldest lasting settlements from the 13 original colonies. So there's a lot of history here. And on weekends, you know, we would just go check out open houses for homes from the 1700s, 1800s. And they were all beautiful, but nothing really felt right for us. Um, One of the hallmarks of the construction of that time was a really large open floor plan on the first floor and then a very boxy second floor. And that didn't necessarily scare us. Again, my husband's a real estate developer, so he was like, oh, I can I can do this all myself. Um, But for whatever reason, it didn't really fit. Um, Then one day I remember so clearly I had a pediatrician's appointment. I think it was my daughter's 18 month, 18 month. Uh, appointment. And he was like, swing by this house. There's an open house. Swing by this house before you go. So I get here to this house and it's a law firm. It's a full-blown commercial law firm. Every room is an office. There's no kitchen. There's one powder bath on each floor. And we walk through it really quick. Again, I had to get to the pediatrician's appointment. And we get outside and he's like, so what do you think? And I was like, I think it's a law firm. Like, what do you want me to think about it? Um, And he told me it was going up for auction. The law firm had been bought out by a regional firm. And one of the conditions of the sale was they had to get rid of this building and move into more modern offices. So he was like, we could get this out of steel. And I was like, that's fine. But I like, it's a law firm. I don't understand. So I remember so clearly that night, we sat down at the dining table after putting the baby to to bed. And he, on a piece of napkin, literally drew up out for me like here is what we would turn into a bedroom here's what we would turn into the dining room and then I was like okay it makes sense when you're not in that business it's very hard to visualize um but so that was May of 2019 a couple weeks later the building went on auction we won the auction in June 2019 closed on the house uh July 2019 found out we were pregnant with our second um The law firm had a four month notice period. So they were actually in the building until October, November. We started construction right around Thanksgiving and moved in in February. So like three months, I was 38 weeks pregnant. Um, We moved in February 20th, delivered my son March 14th and March 22nd, the world shut down for COVID. And that was four years ago. And here we are. And it's It's unbelievable sometimes to look around and think we made it and we ended up in this beautiful space and we turned it from that very commercial, very sterile law firm into um, a home that is so unique. It really is like a once in a lifetime home, but also so functional for our families, right? Sometimes it can be very hard to turn a historic property into something that really works for your family. We have three kids under the age of six 
We have two elderly parents living with us. So it's a space we spend a lot of time. It's a space that sees a lot of living. Um, so we're just so excited, so honored, so grateful uh, to be the stewards of this property in its new chapter. Amazing story. I was not expecting that. <laughs> Unreal. So it just sounds like there's been so much love and heart put into this home to make it yeah. yours. How important was it to you and your family to preserve the history of this building? It was so important. And actually, that's something I probably should have mentioned in the introduction. So the home was built in 1890 as a single family home by this incredible entrepreneur widow. Um, she had lost her husband and she built this house which at the time was kind of uptown for Albany. It was outside city proper. Now it's, you know, within the downtown um, boundaries, but at the time it was like the suburbs. And um, she was a very well-traveled woman. She had spent a lot of time in Europe. So she pulled a lot of architectural elements from French architecture at the time. And that's what I was saying when we had been window shopping for houses before, nothing really felt right because it was very boxy. But this house, because of this woman's progressive vision and how much she had seen in the world, um, the floor plans across the floors are almost identical. You have these offensively large hallways that are 10 feet wide. You have these gigantic rooms. I mean, I think each of our bedrooms is 300 to 400 square feet. The entire building is about over 12,000 square feet. So there's a lot of a lot of character here. So built as a single family home, um, went through a couple families. She left uh, after, I think, just two years of being in the home. She found it too depressing, too far away. She left. I think two or three more families lived here. Then SUNY Albany bought it and used it as a dorm for about 50 years. And at one point, 80 boys lived in this house. And then in the 80s, a commercial uh, real estate firm bought it and they housed a couple different uh, companies here. There was like a PR firm, there was a smaller law firm, et cetera. And then late 80s, the firm that we purchased a house from bought it and they used it as their headquarters for better part of um, 30 years. So purchasing it from that law firm and turning it back to its original intended use of a single family home was really important to us. Also really cool to have our kids be the first kids kind of running through the halls in over a century in this house, right? But the house has just remarkable character and detail. And we were so lucky to have purchased it from a law firm that was so dedicated to also preserving its natural uh, and historic detail. So you can see behind me, all of that detail is hand carved plaster. Every single ceiling has different trim. Every single floor is different, uh, a different design of wood. Most of the rooms have different types of wood used. We have these two absolutely stunning porches on both the first floor and the second floor of the home that overlook Washington Park, which is the big park in downtown Albany that was designed by the same gentleman who designed Central Park and Prospect Park in uh, New York City. The only home in Albany that has this, right? We are known as the home with the big porches. It has a very Charleston feel. Um, so I give you all these examples to show you how unique this home is. And even if you wanted to build something like this today, you couldn't. You're not going to find people who can do this hand-carved, incredibly detailed ceiling work. And so it was it was very, very important to us to keep that original character, to preserve something that's lasted through the test of time, right? And not replace it with kind of the cookie cutter consumerist stuff you see now. Um, but it was also equally important. Like I said, we have three kids, young kids. We have two elderly parents. My husband has a very large extended family. We host a lot. There's always people in and out of the home. Um, so it was also very important for us to have a home that was entirely livable and not a home that had, you know, 10 rooms sectioned off and only one room that people can actually sit in. We had to build a new kitchen from scratch. We had to build new bathrooms. And so those aren't entirely period appropriate, um, but they're functional and they go with the character of the house. And that was, that always, you know, we're still doing work on it now. And that remains at the forefront of anything we do. Wow. 
12,000 square feet. I know. Mind. My Dyson really gets a workout. <laughs> yes. I Can you talk about some of the challenges that you face in having to take this large space, this historic home that really didn't have all of the things that you needed? Like you said, kitchens, yeah. bathrooms that were yeah. needed to be built. What were some challenges that you ran into during your renovation? I think the hardest thing that people don't realize about historic homes is they're historic for a reason, right? They Construction was very different back then. And we're used to, you know, just drywall sheetrock. You can you punch a hole through it. You can't do that with these walls. These walls are 12 inches thick. There's brick, lath. St- I mean, they are indestructible. And that's why they've lasted 130 years. So I am, I thought, a very handy person, but I you know, you can't screw in a closet rod in these walls. There's a specific drill that you need basically for brick. Um, And so that was really challenging, right? To know that nothing is a quick, easy fix. Nothing is straightforward. This house is also on a hill. It's right up. We sit at the top of Washington Park. It has settled tremendously over the past uh, century and a half. And so there's not a single straight surface. Everything slopes a little this way. Our main hallway downstairs kind of looks like the ocean. It goes through a wave. You know, you, you put a chair by a desk in one corner of the room and you know a day later it's on the other corner because it's just rolled down um so that's also challenging right you don't have straight lines um nothing is off the shelf everything has to be custom made the scale of this home is absolutely massive like i said we have 12 foot ceilings we have these gigantic rooms our doorways are not standard so everything is very custom and very expensive. And we're so lucky that my husband is a real estate developer. He did a lot of the work himself. Um, and that we have found some really incredible artisans that have helped us do a lot of the custom work. But yes, it gets very pricey and it gets very difficult. Everything is an out-of-the-box solution. You can't just go to like Home Depot and pick a door and install it, you know. So I think those have been the really big challenges. Oh, and then the fact that the world shut down, you know, a couple months after we moved in. Um, So that was tough. It really sounds like quite the adventure for you guys, but so unique. I'm, I'm loving hearing all the little quirks and little things that, you know, people in, you know, a newer build aren't dealing with, but It sounds like you're having way more fun. (laughs) We really are. And if anybody had told me when we, you know, the day we purchased the home on auction, if anybody had told me all the challenges we would face and, you know, how hard it would be and how many fights we would have and how stressful it would be, we would have probably thought twice about doing it. But I'm so glad I came into it kind of so naive. And looking back now, having gone through the hardest part, I'm like, yeah, okay, you know, all's well that ends well. Of course, in in the moment, it was difficult. Um, But again, you know, sometimes I really look around and I look back on pictures from when we were in the middle of construction. You know, my husband only allowed me to come visit the house once a week during that like last month. And I remember every single day after I visited, I would sit in the parking lot in my truck and I would cry. Remember, I'm like third trimester pregnant. And I was like, what have we gotten ourselves into? How will this be completed? But now I look around and I'm so proud of what we've built. And I'm so proud of all the work we've done. And so much of it has been with our own two hands, right? Of course, there were a lot of, like I said, amazing artisans, amazing uh, craftsmen that came in and helped us. But in every single room, there's stuff that we have done. All the hardwood restoring, my husband did it himself, right? So it's it's amazing to walk through a space and know that you have really, truly left your mark on it. And, you know, hopefully the family that's in here in a hundred years will like what we've done um, and as they add their mark. But it's it's a really beautiful thing. It's a really beautiful thing. So amazing. I'm feeling so inspired by your experience <laughs> and all that you guys have been able to I would to not have said this three years ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can't imagine being third trimester and just wanting to get things done and wondering. Yeah. And because we know a lot of times with renovation, even construction, you don't know. You think you have a timeline and anything could happen. So 
I'm so exactly. happy for you that you guys were able to move in and get settled and continue on. With yeah. That. And you know, I'm so like, we, we moved in literally, it was still a construction zone. It was very important to me to move in before um, my son was born. And, you know, at the time, like, yes, COVID was, people were starting to talk about it, but nobody really took it seriously. And nobody would have believed four years ago that we would still be here. So I pushed my husband to get in and when I say we were construction zone, like we were construction zone, my island literally was delivered at the same time my moving trucks came in. Like everything, we had one functional bathroom, um, we had working sinks, but work very much continued when we moved in. But I'm so glad we pushed and persevered through that because like I said, a month later, the world shut down. And if we hadn't moved in then, I don't, I don't know how much time we would have lost. Wow. That timing was impeccable. So speaking of some of the hands-on DIY renovations, we have been privy to see your amazing Instagram account and some different renovations that you've done yourself. Um, And of course, one of our favorites is the adorable fireplace renovation in your daughter's bedroom using Tile Club's Buttons Porcelain Tile Collection. What sparked the idea for that project? So, oh my gosh, I'm going to start crying during this one because my daughter's room is really important to me. Um, You know, we moved in, I told you, when she was, she was 19 months when we moved in because her and my son are 19 months apart. She was a baby, right? And in the very, in a very short period of time, she left the only home she had known, moved into something. Our townhouse was 1,200 square feet. So we literally upgraded to 10 times the house. Um, So she moved into this gigantic space, got a new brother who was colicky and cried all the time. So it was a lot of change for a little kid. So her room was the very first room I set up. I remember the night before we moved in, I waddled over here, you know, set up her crib, set up her dresser, set up a basket of her toys. Um, We had an amazing nanny at the time who drove her over first thing while we were situating the movers, just so she would feel comfortable in her space. And, um, you know, again, when you move into a house this large, it's very overwhelming to know where to start. I don't have any formal design training or experience. I was just kind of flying by the seat of my pants and by my like hormonal roller coaster, right? So her room was the first one. It felt manageable and I threw myself into it. I did this beautiful gallery wall that's still up in her room. Um, I got this really cute bow holder for all of her clips and stuff. Then I didn't touch it for a very long time. Two and a half years ago, when I found out we were expecting our classic surprise number three baby, when we found out she was a girl, I was like, okay, I want the two girls to share a room. And I thought it was high time to give some sort of upgrade to it. So redid the closet, which is another project. And then the fireplace, I had never really looked at any of the fireplaces in the house. SUNY had closed them off. Obviously with 80 boys, you don't want functional fireplaces in every room. And, you know, we had so many other big things to do that the fireplaces never even like appeared in my view when I was looking at a room. And when I was looking at her room, thinking about how I can refresh it, it like stuck out to me. Like, what is this eyesore and why haven't we done anything to it? There was just this stone slab at the bottom that was gray and very drab. The surround was brick that had been painted like a cream, which looked beautiful. But the slab was just very ugly, kind of cracked. And honestly, again, I don't have any design, formal design training. I find a lot of my inspiration from social media, whether it's Instagram, whether it's Pinterest, whether it's, you know, a catalog from a furniture store. And somebody, um, and I can get you the exact name of the handle. She had redone a fireplace with Penny Tile. And Penny Tile was all the rage. This was like last year. Another amazing South Asian uh, creator that I follow, Kim and Casa, had done. She had redone her guest bath and done this beautiful custom Penny Tile floor. And it started like spinning circles in my head. What if I did something custom in this room that would really be so special to this room? 
um, and liven it up. So we have a lot of like purples, turquoise, pinks, and yellows in the room. And then this like drab gray fireplace was not on brand. So I started toying with the idea of it. And then as like none of my DIYs are planned, right? I kind of jump in. I'm a Leo. I just like jump in and then figure it out. So I went online and went onto your website and I was like, I'm just going to order every color penny towel you guys have. And, you know, they came and I would match them with like the color of the rug and the bedding and see what worked. And it all kind of just started coming together. And I remember it took me a month and a half to do it. And I changed the design like six times. My daughter helped me do it. And the great thing about penny tile is it's very customizable, but it's also very labor intensive, right? Like you have to pop out each tile at once and then, you know, replace it. But the end result was this beautiful, very vibrant, very, um, it's just like when I look at it, it's cheerful and it's happy. And when I look at it, even now, it's been, you know, a year and a half since we've completed it. Even now I look at it and I remember sitting there with my son and my daughter picking out the tiles and then, you know, um, the design of the vase, the blue tiles in the vase. That was my daughter's idea. She was like, Mama, you have to put water for the flowers, you know? It feels so good to see that and know this was something we did together and again, just left our mark on this room. And it'll probably suck for the next family who comes in and uses it as a boy's room or wants to use it as like a formal office. But for right now, it's it's exactly what I wanted for the room. It adds cheer. It adds such a beautiful, distinct and custom touch. And I, I can't believe when I look at it that I did that. It was my first time tiling. It was my first time using Thinset, my first time using Grout, but goes to show you that internet can teach you anything. It really is happy. I, every time I scroll through, um, you know, some of our UGC and I see some of the different collaborations we've done or just projects we've been tagged in, I literally smile every time I see that one because it's so bright and happy. You did such yeah. a wonderful job with the color scheme and from the rug to the fireplace, everything is, is just perfect. Obviously, the result was absolutely stunning and penny rounds are timeless. So maybe the next person will decide to make a change or maybe not. You never know. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. that's what I mean, right? Like really honoring the character of the home while also doing something that feels right for your use. So exactly like you said, penny tile has been used for decades, for over a century. There very well may have been penny tile in the home back when it was uh, created. So that part felt like it was very um, true and period appropriate, but you know, the colors may have been different than what they would have chosen. Speaking of those vibrant, beautiful colors, let's talk a little bit about how you went about incorporating your South Asian imprint into the design of your home. Yeah, absolutely. So um, it, it's a really interesting and difficult thing to do that, right? When you When you buy a home, that's historic, you really have to respect the energy of the home. And these homes really do come with such a strong and grand character and energy. So our home is a federal Victorian um, mansion and you can't put the all beige, all neutral vibe in here. It doesn't go, it doesn't fit. And worked out perfectly because we are first generation Pakistani Muslim Americans and our culture is very rich in colors, in textiles, in fabric. And it's actually been the most beautiful journey to marry those two energies together, to still respect and highlight the stately grandness of the home, while also incorporating this warmth from uh, the Pakistani textiles and rugs. We have some beautiful rugs in the home, rich in reds and greens, which is like not what you see mostly over Instagram. But it really brings out a coziness and warmth in the home. So one thing that it's my favorite compliment, and so far almost everybody who's come through the doors has said it, is for such a large home, it still feels very warm and cozy. And that's exactly what we were going for and what we need, right? We, Like I said, I don't want my kids growing up in a house where they can't go to that room or that room or that room. My kids go to every single room. And I think bringing that 
South Asian richness of the culture has really helped us achieve that vibe in the house. But it was very important. It was very important for our um, tradition, our identity to be reflected in the home. Uh, We're also very active. My husband sits on the board of the local historic preservation society. And there's not a lot of minority people who get into old home ownership or restoration. So it's very important to us that being a part of this community, um, we bring our own flavor to it. And I'm so happy and proud that we've achieved that. What a beautiful thing for the community and for your family as well. This has just been so wonderful today to to get to know more about you and how you've infused your love for your heritage, your passion for design, even though you feel like you don't have a lot of experience, you've been able to preserve this beautiful home. And I just, it's so It's really been healing in a way, right? Like I do this really boring day job and then I work from home, luckily, which is amazing, but Um, There's no separation between my work and home life. And so I use the house as like my creative outlet. Um, Like I said, the past four years have been crazy. We had a colicky newborn, COVID happened, then a surprise third baby. And the house has been so cathartic for me and so healing for me. Um, And, you know, there's research about the chemicals that are released in your body when you do something with your hands. And it's, it's so true. So it's... It's been really fun, really tough, really stressful, but really fun. What advice would you give to people who are wanting to renovate their own space? What's your one piece of advice that you would like to leave with us today? Oh my God, be intentional. You have to be intentional. You can't do an entire room at once. Don't do something just for the sake of getting it done. Take your time, whether it's a DIY, whether it's a piece of furniture, find something that speaks to you and will stay with you. I feel like we are living in such a challenging time of just being bombarded at all times with information and images. And it leads to this like well, that person has that. I should have that. And, you know, if I just buy all this, then maybe I'll get it. And you have to be intentional. Nobody's, nobody's space is like your space. Nobody's story is like your story. Nobody's needs are like your needs. You know, I don't think I could have gone out even if I wanted to and hired a designer and gotten to the point where we're at. And that's not to say that I've done it perfectly. I'm sure like my proportions are wrong and my colors are wrong, but it's what we needed and it's what works for us. And I, my advice would just be like, trust your gut, trust your instinct. Don't be scared to make mistakes either. You don't have to do it perfect, but if you're really just intentional, if you sit with it, you'll end up with something far greater than any catalog could give you. Thank you again so much for sharing your insights and experience with us. It's been such a pleasure to have you on the show. This was so fun, Lindsay, and thank you for having me. And let's see what else we can do. I love it. Let's do it. And to all our listeners, be sure to check out Mehek's Instagram at our 1890 Contique for more inspiring design ideas. We'll put all the links in our show notes today. That's all for today's episode of Tile Trends. Until next time, happy renovating.